let's let's get started. Uh, perfect. Continue. Um, so the task today is to talk about and learn something about the cervical degenerative disease and um, assessment and management and types of treatments that we render uh, to patients, uh, mainly surgical treatments and surgical approaches and complications. As you can imagine, there's a very broad topic and uh, there's about 200 slides here that encompass basically three major lectures on uh, cervical degenerative disease, disc replacements, and approaches and complications. So um, I will go through some of them fairly quickly, like cervical disc replacement, uh, and then stay, uh, spend a little bit more time on things like complications uh, and assessment. Um, and that will round it out, I think, a little bit better. So let's start. Oh, my arrows. Oh, there it goes. So degenerative disc disease, right? When does it happen and who does it happen to? Well, the it happens to all of us. It typically starts once we hit the age of 30. Most people have uh, start to develop symptoms when they're in their 40s from like things like herniated discs, not as much arthritis, but main, mainly uh, soft, pro soft tissue problems like herniated disc and, and uh, facet problems. Um, and this is because when they hit the age of 30, their discs start to wear and tear. So well over uh, 25 to 30% of people over the age of 30 will have disc degeneration on their MRIs, although they may be asymptomatic. And that rises uh, incrementally as they get older. Once you are over 55, you're less likely to have things like herniated discs, and you're more likely to have problems that are associated with cervical spondylosis, AKA cervical degenerative arthritis, which is a sequelae of the mechanical changes that occur when the discs start to wear. So uh, if the discs are tignant, when they're normal, when they're abnormal, the, the, the forces still have to transition across. They just bypass the disc and they bypass it through the facet joints and the ligamentous structures surround and the muscular structures surround. the spine and mechanical pain as well, which causes radiculopathy or the spinal cord, which can cause myelopathy. So if you're looking at somebody over the age of 55, uh, they may have more myelopathy than radicular problems, but it is obviously a progression because typically what happens is that the frame and tighten up first, followed by the central canal when you're looking at uh, spondylosis, okay? Uh, it's also important to note that the majority of people uh, tend to be asymptomatic despite the fact that they may have ugly looking MRIs. And it's very important to determine where the source of the pain is, especially in the older individuals which, who may have multi-level disease or multi-level, not disease, but pathology. Okay. Clinical pain syndromes in cervical spine, and, and please feel free to enter Interrupt and no, there's never a bad question. Okay, so clinical pain syndromes and cervical spine, as you know, uh, the first two, radiculopathy and myeloradiculopathy, or uh, and myelopathy. Uh, myelopathy is not really associated with pain, so it's myeloradiculopathy and radiculopathy are associated with neural compression. And really, radiculopathy means the nerve root is being compressed, and the nerve root can be compressed in multiple places in the spine. And we can talk, we'll talk about that. There's a problem called discogenic. 
megaxial pain, which is a very dying, very discogenic pain. We had things, uh, tests that were created by the pain management people and uh, such as um, discography, which uh, in which you put a needle into the disc and pressurize the disc and the pressure within the disc elicits some pain pattern. And if that pain pattern corresponds with the patient's clinical presentation, then we think that that, that has some correlation uh, to suggest is causing the pain on those patients in the best case scenario and the best of hands, uh, the, the chance of getting better is typically at best uh, 75 to 80%. And as you can tell, something that requires injecting a needle into the disc and, and recording somebody's pain, uh, which is a subjective um, measure, is very dependent upon the, the person who's doing the test right? So if you have uh, just like, like ultrasounds, you know, a good ultrasonographer can tell you a lot about ultrasonographer can really lead you astray. So it's really important to have somebody who actually is good at doing these studies before you actually get them um, and uh, like garbage in and garbage out. So uh, some people, there's only a few people in probably the country that do a good cervical discography. Uh, they also precede that discography with uh, a uh, psychological assessment as well. And then finally, there's this problem called suboccipital impingement syndrome. Uh, it comes goes under multiple names and it's due to the fact that the patient has a malaligned neck. And uh, most of the time people, um, as they wear and tear their cervical spine, they'll go into more flexion so they'll lose extension. And in order to look forward, you have to extend your neck. And when we're, we're just, when we are in good alignment, our, we, we have a very, uh, quite a bit of flexion and extension range. But when you're flexed, your extension range is limited by the baseline loss. And when we try to extend, you're constantly extending your head against your spine to look forward. And that puts a lot of pressure at the base of the skull. Your, your uh, C1 and C2 roots, which can cause uh, base of the neck, uh, base of the skull pain. And then over time, uh, the, because of the malalignment, uh, there's a lot of stress at the base of the neck near the cervical thoracic junction because the muscles have to work extra hard to pull against gravity. So those are syndromes that uh, we can encounter and that we should uh, be aware of as part of the difference. Any questions thus far? Okay. So this is a patient who's got uh, a disc herniation, the uh, fairly standard location for it, paracentral herniation, and it's at the C6, C7 level. And at the C6, C7 level, at the level of the problem, it's the nerve root that, that's, uh, the nerve root that exits is C7, right? So there are uh, uh, seven cervical roots and then it, they exit uh, at the level above. So at C67, the seven root exits, uh, not the six root. In the lumbar spine at, at uh, C, uh, L5S1, the L5 root exits. So it's a level of just that you know. And these are the uh, dermatomal pain patterns that people can experience. Note uh, that the C7 root is in the middle finger. That means that C6 is in the thumb and, thumb and index. And that uh, C8 is in the, um, in the little finger. And C5 and C6 can um, mix a little bit. Uh, sometimes people can have one dermatomal distribution off. Uh, also important to note the distribution of the C3 and C4 roots. And you can tell that uh, the C3 nerve root can um, radiate into the ear and into the jaw. And the C4 root can radiate into the neck. And remember uh, that when you have a diaphragmatic uh, 
irritation, C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. The, uh, you can have jaw pain and uh, kind of neck and upper chest pain. And that, that is in the realm of the C3, 4, and 5 groups. Okay. So we, the roots have a very, very uh, distinct pattern of pain. However, the facets are kind of overlapping. So facetogenic pain is another pain syndrome elicited by irritation or wear and tear of the facet joints. And you have two of them on each side uh, at each level. So also notable is that the C3-4 facet joint can be in the same distribution as the C3 and C4 roots, right? The C4-5 facet joint, which is the C5 root, can also be in the same proximal distribution as the C4 and C5 roots. However, C5-6 and C6-C7 uh, levels, which are the C6 and C7 roots, they have this notable uh, trapezial, me medial periscapular pain and kind of pain that goes kind of near the armpit area. And when patients have that particular distribution, be wary of facetogenic pain syndromes. It's hard sometimes to determine what's facetogenic and what is uh, neuropathic, right, or radicular, mainly because they, the syndromes tend to overlap, but facetogenic pain syndromes tend to be more proximal or more, more I'm sorry, more centralized, more axial uh, near the spine, whereas the radicular syndrome, except for the upper cervical levels, uh, tend to be uh, radiate down into the arm. Also important to know is that the innervation or the medial branch to the facet joint, and we had a good talk uh, with Connor O'Neill at the last uh, spine uh, journal, uh, spine um, didactic session, comes from the root at the level of and the root at the level above. So at C4, C5, which is the C5 root, that C4, C5 facet is innervated by the C5 and the C4 branches, medial branches from the C5 and C4 roots. Okay, so when you're trying to burn that nerve or trying to diagnose whether or not that facet is painful, you have to anesthetize or burn the nerve, uh, the medial branch from the nerve above and the medial branch from the nerve at the same level. So two burns, two areas of burning to deal with one facet joint. So unlike radiculopathy, uh, myelopathy is, you know, relatively asymptomatic in, term, in regards to pain. Patients have functional loss and they, they have very little overall discomfort. They have pins and needle sensations in their hands and uh, they may have some numbness, but it's really not pain. And often these people uh, will just kind of blow it off because it doesn't hurt them. And they have gait disturbances or dexterity loss, which they uh, often um, uh, blame on old age and loss of vision. And all those things do occur, but it's really important that they are aware that these symptoms can also be a sign uh, or can also be a, a symptom of spinal cord compression. And I've shown this multiple times as a lady who uh, I, one of my first cases at SFGH when I first started back in 2000 and came in quadriplegic um, because she had this central canal stenosis from ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. And she was, uh, had gait disturbance, but she thought that she was just getting old and was chasing around her little uh, grandchild and tripped and fell and had a hyperextension injury and came in quadriplegic. And when you're uh, over the age of 70 and you're quadriplegic, you're, it's pretty much a death sentence. You know, you can't get around, you succumb to infection, pneumonia, and um, other problems with immobility. So how do we diagnose uh, radiculopathy versus myelopathy? Well, 
the, the, the most important thing about radiculopathy is the pattern that the patient describes. And if there's any myotomal uh, losses, such as, uh, you know, actually myotomal uh, uh, pattern strength loss, right? So if you look at uh, what the myotomes are, you should be very familiar. Uh, C5 is the deltoid. C4 is kind of like three and four trapezius. Um, and uh, C6 is uh, biceps and wrist extensor. And C7 is wrist flexor, finger extensor. And C8 is finger flexors. And, um, and T1 and C8 are kind of uh, your abductors. So all those things could, should be checked uh, to see if there's any uh, weakness. And if they have a radicular pattern pain, you have to focus in on that particular nerve root to, to really test it well, right? And how do you test it? Well, you can test manual strength, uh, grading from uh, zero, zero, to four, zero to five. Uh, however, uh, a lot of times in subtle situations, you'll have to test it against the patient's own strength or uh, repeated testing for fatigue. And patients who have subtle weakness will tend to fatigue after multiple attempts at uh, strength testing. And uh, if they go to the gym, they'll notice that they can't do as many reps on one side. It becomes much more obvious. Although the true grading is subtle, it may be four plus or even a five minus or even five, when you test them against resistance, then it becomes much more obvious. For myelopathy, there's a, it's a lot harder because what you're testing are long track signs and you're testing posterior column deficiency, things like proprioception, uh, which, cause, which can cause uh, gait imbalance. And uh, you look for hyperactive reflexes. And reflexes become hyperactive when, the, when there's a central source, right? Also reflexes become much more hyperactive when there's both a central source that accentuates the reflex along with a local source that diminishes the, the normal reflex. So over here um, for a Hoffman's reflex, which is the most sensitive reflex for cervical stenosis, uh, there's many ways to do it, but most people put their, put, you know, hold their, um, Hold, their, hold the patient's middle finger or the index finger like a middle or index finger like a, like you're holding a cigarette or something like that if anybody still smokes, I guess not, or cigar maybe. Uh, and uh, you flick the DIP joint and you look for reflex contraction of the index and thumb. And if it's symmetric, you, it may, it could be central, like in the brain, and it could be normal. But if it's asymmetric, uh, then it's usually something pathologic. Okay, uh, you're, you're going to test for hyperflexia. You're going to test for things like a reverse radial reflex, where you pit the brachioradialis, which is the C6 a reflex, and um, you look for um, basically finger flexor. Uh, finger flexion. And that occurs, the Hoffman's is a, is a very sensitive reflex because the finger flexor reflex, right? It tests uh, hyperflexor, hyperflexia that occurs at the C8 level or below because that's where the, uh, that's where the lesion has to be above the C8 level. And so that's why it's such a sensitive uh, reflex to test for cervical stenosis because everything, any stenosis up above C8 would typically give you a positive Hoffman's test. Whereas a brachioradialis reflex, the C6 reflex has to be diminished. So you have to have some uh, compression of the C6 root in addition to stenosis at the C6 level and above. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, thanks, Adam. So here's a patient who's got a uh, gait disturbance, right? And you can see he's kind of wiggling in terms of walking. He's trying to put one foot in front of the others, but his core is kind of unstable. 
and this is from a long time ago, and he's got multi-level cervical stenosis from ossification to posterior longitudinal ligament. As you can see, that's Reza, who's an attending up in Seattle, if anybody is, is going to train up there. Uh, other ways to evaluate uh, for, for uh, cervical stenosis, compression traction. You put tra it all, compression traction actually also evaluates for radiculopathy. So if you have nerve compression due to collapse, you give people some gentle traction in flexion, right? You don't want to give them traction and extension. You flex them, it decompresses their facets as well as opens up their foramen and uh, a little bit of traction can, can relieve some of the discomfort. In, in contrast, if you compress on their spine in extension, they can have worsening discomfort. And um, this is a, a, a decent test. We don't do that very often because it causes discomfort for the patient. Their meat sign is a sign that uh, was originally described when people were uh, trying to diagnose multiple sclerosis. And this is causes uh, a lightning bolt sensation down the back of the uh, spine when, when you, you, you rapidly go from, uh, from uh, neutral to flexion. So if you ask the patient to flex their, their neck very quickly, they can get a lightning bolt shot. It's nonspecific because it can also be a sign of, um, of, of multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating diseases. And when you see that, uh, all the people have, have, uh, can have cord lesions um, like myelomalacia, it's important that uh, you, you take a look at the brain scan and make sure that they don't have uh, multiple sclerosis or any lesions in their brain because that could totally mess up the outcome of your surgery as well. It's better to know beforehand, uh, although it may not change if you do surgery or not, if the patient's got severe central stenosis, you're going to treat that anyway, because that is a potentially a reversible cause of dysfunction. Multiple sclerosis, unfortunately, is not reversible. So when patients have subtle symptoms, what is a natural history and how do people actually do over time? Do you have to operate on them right away? And the answer really is, in patients who have subtle symptoms, you actually do not need to do surgery right away because the course of progression is very slow and very slow is in the span of years. Uh, although people do progress, they progress, not all of them progress to the point of needing surgery, right? So the classic study was by uh, Nancy Epstein, a uh, neurosurgeon in New York. And uh, the, the patients, the majority of patients kind of stayed the same. If you can read, 36% improved, 64% did not improve. So almost, you know, 100% of patients, uh, only, only a subset didn't improve, but of that subset didn't improve, only 26% got worse. So a very small number of people actually got worse. But it is clearly patients go through stepwise deterioration. It's not progressive like this. It goes like this. So if, if the patients will have years of quiescence and then lose a level of function. So you intervene when patients are, are, have lost sufficient amount, enough function that it's, the next level of loss could be a significant impairment, right? And the earlier you, you, you intervene at that point, the better off patients do over time. So when, when we look at patients and say, hey, do you need surgery or not? The main indications for an operation are progressive root or spinal cord dysfunction uh, that leads to either persistent intolerable pain or severe or progressive weakness despite conservative management, a period of conservative management. Obviously the patient is getting progressively weaker. You're gonna have, it's an urgency or an emergency. 
they lose bowel or bladder function, urgency or emergency. But most of the time, if it's just pain, even if the pain is severe, you should start them on a conservative management program, which includes physical therapy, traction, the anti-inflammatories, some oral steroids, um, to help mitigate the discomfort so that they can hopefully um, uh, wait it out long enough that the symptoms themselves will, uh, will improve over time. The majority of people tend to slowly improve over time. And over time, what's a period of time, typically between six weeks and three months is how long we tend to wait as long as they're not getting weaker. Even if they have a baseline level of, of weakness, like a four out of five, which is weak, but it's not severely weak and can still function, we would allow them to uh, wait and, and, and monitor them over time for progression. If they have severe weakness, like they can't move, their arm is paralyzed, then you have to operate on them. Okay. And surgical, surgical approaches, um, in the subaxial spine, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a standard Smith-Robinson Smith approach anteriorly. Uh, upper cervical spine is a little bit more um, technically difficult, and we usually use our ENT physicians to help us out in the submandibular transoral and mandibular splitting approaches. And then posterior approaches are typically all midline. There is a lateral approach where you can actually see the vertebral artery, but uh, we, we typically don't use that approach. The standard Smith-Robinson approach, as you know, anybody who's been with me in the operating room, um, we've, we've done this a lot. It's a blunt dissection between a normal tissue plane, uh, between uh, um, the strap muscles, uh, while well, we go through the platysma in the beginning, then you go through the strap muscles, and then you go to the interval between the uh, trachea and the uh, trachea and esophagus complex and the carotid sheath. And then underneath all that, you'll, you'll see the um, longus coli and the alar fascia, which is this fascia over here, or the prevertebral fascia, as some people like to call it. And it's called alar fascia because when you trace it out, it looks like a, the wings of a bird, okay? Or as it's flying towards you. Um, on the left-hand side is the, the, in, the incision areas where typically people make uh, uh, to determine levels. And it's, it's good to generally know, but most of the time we do these things, we do it under lateral fluoroscopy and really precisely determine where the incision should be. And we've gone that way mainly because of disc replacements. And when we do disc replacements, we have to be directly in line with the disc space there's not a lot of tolerance for being off uh, one way or the other. Whereas in ACDS, we, we have a lot more tolerance because we take a little bit more bone off so we can visualize inner body space better. Um, kind of for your, for your learning, I guess, uh, the key elements for determining level, if you want to do it by anatomic uh, approach, is C6 is really the cricoid, right? So uh, if you're gonna, if you look for C5, C6, uh, it's at the level of the cricoid. C6, C7 is probably gonna be just slightly below the level of the cricoid. Uh, thyroid cartilage is, is expansive. So between C4 and C6, hyoid bone is really is like around C3, C4. And the mandible is C1, C2, or C2, C3. It's really uh, very high up. Hey, Dr. Day, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. What's your indication for asking ENT to help with an approach? Is it what, three, four and above? Um, are there yeah. certain body habitus oh. is that? Uh... Very good question. So when do we ask them to do the approach? Well, mo most of the time, there's a couple of indications, right? The first indication is, uh, for me, it's a high approach that has, that it has to uh, get at like C2, C3 or above. And those require working around the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve, which runs on top of the fascia of the salivary gland. And if you get that nerve, the patient's gonna have a, a, a droopy mouth on one side. So it's a very, very bad complication. And therefore, 
they know how to get at it. And what typically they do is because it's on the dorse, it's on the uh, ventral surface of the uh, salivary gland fascia, they work underneath the salivary gland and flip the salivary gland uh, uh, cranially in order to use the gland itself to protect the nerve. You know, if you get an uh, injury to the salivary gland, you're gonna get a fistula, right? But I think the fistula is easier to manage than a, than, than a, um, than a uh, injury to the larger mandibular branch. The other times I use uh, ENT is for long approaches, extensile approaches to the cervical spine where you're going from like C34 all the way down to C67. And I'm worried that I, I need to do a transverse incision for cosmesis. And you do a, you can, they can do a very long uh, transverse incision and pull and do a neck dissection all the way down and get you, get you where you need to go for four levels with a more cosmetic incision. Otherwise, you can actually get to that incision through a oblique incision and get to all those levels from three, three, four all the way down to even to, down to C71. Okay. So that's your extensile, typical standard extensile approaches oblique along the borders, along the medial border of sternocleidomastoid. So, um, however, that's not a very cosmetic uh, incision. And uh, cosmesis and it does matter uh, because people have to live with that for the rest of their life, right? The other time that, that ENT is very useful is when patients are need revision surgery, especially when you're used, when they've had a prior right-sided approach from, uh, and you, you're not the one that did it, right? So your choice is either go back on the right side through the scarred area, or you go on the left side, which is a, which is a virgin area, and which has less scar would be easier to expose. But if you go on the left side, you have to make sure that the patient has no problems with their recurrent laryngeal nerve, the vocal cord function is low. And the only way to tell is that you have to get somebody to look down and look at the vocal cords. So uh, you either send them to the ENT clinic and have it done, or just ask them to help you. And they do that the, the day of surgery in the pre-op area, and they'll follow you afterwards. Patients who have severe dysphagia that you need to do an anterior approach, uh, which you try to avoid if they have severe dysphagia, uh, are best done in concert with ENT, mainly because they have a fantastic speech, speech swallow program that can follow patients over time and manage them for their, uh, for their voice as well as for their, uh, their swallowing. So uh, they can get baseline measurements uh, and see how people are doing over time. So those are the, those are the times that I use uh, ENT and those are the reasons. Okay. Um, so you see this kind of like a dissection. I think this is the hypoglossal nerve and this is one of the branches of the uh, suprolaryngeal nerve. And this is, an old, old picture of a mandibular splitting approach where they cut the mandible in half, pull on the tongue, and you can see all the way, you can kind of see the hypoglossal nerve right here. Uh, you can see all the way up to uh, C2 and C1, C2. It's pretty crazy. And interesting enough, people do okay, uh, mainly because most of the time when you're doing this is for tumor. And you know, with tumor, the the, the expectations in general uh, are fairly low because people are so focused in on not dying from the tumor. If you get the tumor out, they're very very happy, despite the fact that they may have some morbidity from the approach. Right. So, so we talked about reaching things up high, right? And now we talk about reaching things down low. How far can you get from your standard incision? Uh, and it depends uh, on the patient's anatomy. And most of the time you can get uh, enough exposure to fuse, but not necessarily always decompress C71. And, and a lot, sometimes depending on the patient's uh, anatomy, you can get to T1, T2. But below that, up to T4, you're gonna need to do some uh, manubrial splitting or sternal splitting approach to get access. And that requires uh, help from your thoracic surgeons. 
Luckily, there's not a lot of problems at the CT junction down below C71. And most of the deformities that occur uh, in that upper thoracic area are often addressed through big resections or osteotomies posteriorly in that area, which uh, keeps you from having to uh, violate the uh, chest, okay? Most of the problems are degenerative infections, probably a tumor. And again, um, the, these are uh, fairly rare, luckily. Uh, if you are going to be there, it's really important to know what structures you can injure, right? And these structures include thoracic duct, inf inferior thyroid vein, which comes off of the nominant, the recurrent laryngeal nerve as, as it goes up in the tracheoesophageal groove on the left side, the um, thoracic duct, which is around C71, and, uh, and the phrenic nerve that rides in the carotid sheath. So those are the main things. When you're, look, when, you, when you're working down the base near the top of the manubria, you'll often see a vessel, just a vein, just hiding right underneath it. And that vein is the brachiocephalic, uh, it's the brachiocephalic vein. And uh, it is something that you do not wish to injure. So in that area, you really have to be careful not to stick a bovie in there, into that space unless you know exactly uh, what's in, you know, what's protected. And uh, when you're uh, drilling down the maneuver a little bit to get more space to see, you have to be very careful that you don't perforate it because once if you perforate it, you have no control over it uh, because it's inside the chest cavity. It's kind of like that uh, Black Hawk down where the guy has that uh, guy injured his femoral artery and the person was trying to get at it and it retracted into his abdomen. It's very similar to an emergency if you get into that. Okay. I don't know if anybody's seen Black Hawk Down. Very, very, uh, very, very cool movie. So um, here's, a, here's the anatomy, phrenic nerve over here in the carotid sheath, uh, you know, Longus coli muscles, uh, sympathetic trunk clearly, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve on the other side and tracheosophageal groove riding up. Um, those are things that are in your way and that you have to be, uh, that are in the area that you have to be careful about. Okay. So how, how do you know you can access it? And most of the time we get a CAT scan Uh, that includes the maneuvering of the sternum. And again, T4 is pretty much as far as we can see um, below, mainly because below that there's the aortic arch. You can see that over here. And you can't really push down on those things very much because they, they you know, they're, the subclavians shoot out from there, right? And the, uh, so you have to be, uh, you're, there's a limit. Uh, everything else below T4, you have to get from the back. And they have these measurements that are not really necessary for you guys to learn. Okay, so over here you can see you can get reach C71 and T1, T2, even from the front fairly easily to decompress it. Well, uh, let's in this area. Sometimes you can't reach it, but if you do a corpectomy, you'd be able to reach at least enough to decompress the uh, spinal cord. We're at 916 right now. Do you want to take a quick a five minute break, or do you want to keep on going? I think we can keep trucking. Yeah, okay. keep going. Um, let's forget all these approaches. Uh, th there's there's also uh, approaches that were kind of I, that were described a long time ago about taking part of the sternum, uh, maneuvering them out, taking uh, part of the, cutting the clavicle, and then flipping the whole thing over. And people don't really do that. Most of the time, if you're trying to get into the chest, um, you just split the sternum. Uh, and it'll take you all the way down to T4. But uh, remember, these sternal wires and stuff, they're not benign. And uh, most of the complications are due to the fact that there's no 
soft tissue coverage over those wires and it can lead to sternal osteomyelitis and some serious problems. And this is the, you know, resection or, or osteotomy of the manubrium and the clavicle. People don't really do that because it's, there's a lot of morbidity from the shoulder from that. Okay. So let's see, um, when do we go anteriorly? Uh, when we have to approach the whole canal and both nerve roots, we can do that posteriorly as well. But when pe we really kind of say, if you've got a lot of neck pain, we tend to approach it anteriorly because we are able to address the disc, which is uh, one large component, potential component of neck pain. We can control the uh, alignment better from the front um, when we're doing short segments. And we kind of tend to stay away from the adjacent segments because when you, as you can see, when, as you can imagine, when you do a posterior approach, you tend to, your exposure tends to potentially injure uh, the facet capsules in the adjacent segments as well. It's hard to kind of stay uh, in the area that you want to and still be able to see enough to do the work. Um, and then in patients who have significant weakness or numbness, an anterior approach works better because the motor root, motor root, uh, motor component of the nerve is more ventral as it exits the spinal cord. And if you have a big osteophytic spur that's pushing on that component of the nerve, uh, your best and causing weakness, your best bet is to remove it directly versus decompressing in the back and hoping that the nerve has enough. Um, excursion to float away, okay? So weakness and numbness uh, and, defo and uh, kyphotic deformities best approach anteriorly, uh, at least as a first stage. And um, we talked about anterior cervical discectomy. We're gonna talk about anterior cervical discectomy, fusions, uh, foraminotomies and things like disc replacement. As you may, we do so many fusions here. It's really important for you to realize that anterior cervical discectomy without fusion was done in the past and it still remains a viable option. That's when you take out the, remove the herniated disc or part of that herniated disc and you leave the segment unreconstructed. And what happens that segment, it does collapse a little bit and it does collapse into some kyphosis sometimes. And people can develop uh, neck pain after surgery, but if your pain was purely radicular, you can actually get away with that. You have to pay a lot of attention to doing a good foraminal decompression. So there are people out there that have had just anterior cervical discectomy without fusion that have done quite well. If you're trying to do multi-level multi -level ACDs without fusion, then you run into serious problems because you start to add up on the focal kyphosis in, and turn it into more of a global kyphosis, which is a bad deal. Fusions were then uh, done and fusions are great operations because they're very, very uh, reliable surgeries. They tend to heal quite well, especially one level and two level. And um, they, they, they accomplish the goal of removal of the disc reconstruction of the level, uh, improvement of the up-down stenosis. And some people actually just do fusions and they don't even decompress the foramen because they're betting on the fact that you have, uh, you've, you've restored the height of the inner body space, which causes indirect decompression of the neural foramen at that level. And especially in surgery centers, they tend not to be too aggressive because they don't want to lose a lot of blood and they want to be quick. And people can do ACDFs. If you don't want to do a foraminotomy or central decompression, you can do an ACDF in literally half an hour, right? You just take the disc out, clean it out, put a graft in there and put a plate on, you're done. And you don't even have to put a plate on for one level. So, um, and the fusion rate is about the same. Uh, there's anterior cervical foraminotomies and this is a minimally invasive approach to the uncus, and that's where you work uh, to remove the entire, entire uncovertebral joint, and sometimes the herniated disc uh, 
on that uh, on that side. It's usually unilateral uh, for unilateral pain and compression, and uh, it's fairly versatile. But uh, because you're you're working right on the uncus, uh, it requires some specialized equipment like uh, endoscopes and uh, and some fluid under gravity, and you have to be careful about the vertebral artery, which is a devastating complication. And finally, the cervical disc replacement uh, introduced in Europe in the early, uh, in the late 90s, introduced in the US uh, in the first clinical trials in the early 2000s. And uh, we were one of the uh, ID no, first. Just went to sleep. No, she has no peripheral access. No. Oh, yeah. Okie dokie. So, um, what you're used to is the Smith Robinson technique. That's when we take the disc out and we put in a piece of bone that's been fashioned to fit into the inner space. Autograph versus allograph. The gold standard was always autograph from the iliac crest, but there's a lot of iliac crest uh, pain that comes from that and delays patients' recovery. And is it truly worth it? Uh, and typically, uh, it's not necessarily worth it uh, because because if you use for one level, if you look at this. If you look at all the all these studies, for one level, the fusion rate with allograph is pretty damn good, even without a plate. It's fairly comparable to autograph, which is slightly higher, but certainly in most of the studies are at least 90% and above. However, if you have, when you go above one level, adding uh, allograph um, versus autograph, there's a significant uh, difference. And it drops down to you know, some, as low as 38%, but drops down to about 70%. And in those particular situations, the, the addition of a plate to secure the grafts, bring that fusion rate back up to the uh, low to mid nineties. Dr. Tay, like yes. in this series, I mean, 38%, is that just because of 90, was there like a technique difference between 91 and 96 and 96? Uh, and there's, ah, think about this. Think about the authors. So whenever you look at, that's I mean, that's that's those are questions that should be uh, you, sh you should always ask, right? It's so different from everybody else. You know, Tom Zedevlik, and though he is the highest paid Medtronic consultant in the country, and there is no doubt that there are some uh, conflicts that occur that lead to people's uh, reporting of how patients do after certain procedures. And long time ago in 1991, there was no, nobody that was disclosing their conflicts in, in, uh, in the literature. So Tom actually is a good guy, but he's conflicted. So you can imagine how that can turn out when you're trying to push a, a, a cervical plate that he helped design. <laughs> so think, just think about that, right? So there's something fishy, as you said, about this, right? But if you look at the other studies, the, the numbers are more like 70%. It's not 30, 38%. Yeah, yeah. Right? But it still good. suggests that addition of a plate decreases the chance of further surgery to deal with non-unions if you're going to use allograft. If you use autograft, then you probably don't need a plate, but you have to deal with the hospital stay prolongation from graft donor site morbidity. All right, so you you pay you 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 pay uh, at one end, and then you lose at the uh, and then you you win at one end, but you lose at the other end. So it all kind of is about the same. So here's a two level fusion with autograft, and this is kind of like a corpectomy. Uh, allograft, sorry, and clearly it didn't heal without a plate. Uh, this is, I don't know what it is. It, it's adjacent segment disease. So what do plates do? Well, you know, they, they're, the, the literature starts to change, right? Everything that's new is all of a sudden is the best. The shiny thing is great, right? So the, what, the trying to fix the healing potential due to uh, due to lack of load sharing, uh, due to static plating, had led to the development of dynamic plates, the ones that where the screws can toggle or 
or the plate can glide to allow the graft to bear more load and thus heal better. And static plates can't share as much load and dynamic plates help that. And it does increase the healing potential, okay? However, the fact is, is that when you use, uh, this is busy, but uh, this is the same thing with, you know, if you use a plate for more than one level, allograph, if you use a plate, you get a much higher fusion rate. And you can see that right here, right? And again, if you look at some of these studies again, the no plate two levels are about 70% healing. Whereas you throw a plate in, they said it's 100%, but I bet you it's, it's, it's more like 90, mid nineties. And the, um, the, where was I at? So the problem is that when things settle, if you have a plate in the front of the neck, they go into kyphosis, right? They lose their lordosis. And that was not a big issue a long time ago with the, 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 the outcome measure that, that uh, said that this procedure was successful was fusion. And that was like that all throughout the, throughout the late 90s and even early into the mid 2000s, it was always about, did it fuse, did it fuse? It didn't matter if it went to kyphosis as long as it fused because you were measuring success due to fusion and not success because, and, and not problems due to the lack, loss of alignment. So, uh, and people didn't actually have outcome measures at that time. Uh, they had like VAS scores, patient satisfaction, stuff like that. So we didn't really have a good idea of how patients were actually doing in the long term, it, we just always knew that it healed. And somebody who was conflicted was still trying to peddle a new plate design. No matter, but despite all of that, no matter what you use, no matter how you do it, as long as you got the patient to a healed state, the majority of patients, at least in the early and intermediate term, do very well because of the problem that you're trying to treat. You've chosen a good patient when you're dealing with cervical problems typically, because you're dealing with, most of the time you're dealing with patients who have neural compression. And when you release or improve the neural compression, patients get pain relief. And sometimes in the high cervical ones like C3-4, C4-5, they get neck and shoulder pain that's unilateral. And those patients get relief, although you may think it's actual pain, it's actually ridiculous. So these days, those patients, you know, have a dramatic drop in their 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 pain as well as a dramatic improvement in their uh, outcomes early on, which gets sustained up to two years and longer. And again, that's why when you look at things like new new devices such as cages, disc replacement, all that, you're, you're going to see the same graph unless there's a huge problem with the design of the device that causes complications uh, or early failure. If you have a decent device that stays in the inner space, you're going to get a good outcome early and er, in the early and intermediate term because you've operated on the right individual with the right problem. And you did the decompression correctly. Okay. And, and their neck pain also improves, but it's not consistent. These, these, these graphs suggest that they're consistent, but the, but the inclusion criteria for these studies were for patients who had pure, purely radiculopathy, who had mainly radiculopathy as their main problem. Um, and but there is a limit to how many levels that you can do in the front well, right? And the limits are based upon how collapsed the spaces are, how much you need to decompress, and, uh, and the extent of the decompression and how many levels you have to fuse. And this is a patient who had multi-level fusion and it took a quite a bit of their bone out to decompress the spine and put grafts in there. And this is a, what we call a dynamic plate, right? You can see that the screw up top has toggled the spine has settled, and because the plate doesn't settle with the spine, the plate extrudes. The screws toggle, they reach a limit, and the plate pops forward. Is that's 
the only way you can do it because we, if you measure the distance from here, this screw tip, to this screw tip, it fits more anteriorly and spans the level of the operated levels much better than this long plate, which span perfectly when they put it in, but did not span it well when it's settled. And the reason why that happens is because as you put more levels in, in terms of ACDFs, there's more levels that have to subsequently heal, right? And because there's more surface that have to heal statistically, one level has a higher statistical chance of not healing. If you do a one level ACDF, two levels have to heal. If you do a two level, four levels, and it multiplies by two, right? So three level six, and when you're doing three levels and above, the fusion rate uh, drastically goes down. And what was their, what was the uh, recommendation for this? Well, if the fusion rate goes down and because we're measuring fusion as a sign of success, why don't we do a corpectomy? So now we have only two levels that have to heal and the fusion rate should go up and that's successful. So therein lies these other two studies. If we do a corpectomy, wow, the fusion rate goes up. But, but and in some cases, if you're doing a short corpectomy, the outcome is still pretty good. But if you start to do longer and longer corpectomy levels, you start to have more problems with graft dislodgement and, uh, and diminished outcomes. Because when you do a corpectomy, you're creating a, a straight strut. You've Kind of lost lordosis. Ah, itself is fairly small. It's in the, it sits on the more the cancellous portion of the vertebra at the lower level, which is a bigger, bigger vertebra. And because of that, it either settles or tries to kick out. So so then when they started doing corpectomies, long corpectomy, they found that this is the, by trying to solve one problem, they created another problem and it, it caused a lot of graft dislodgement, which was very difficult to deal with. They had to fuse them in the back, multiple levels. So if you're gonna do a multi-level ACDF and you have one or two levels that don't heal, you can fuse one or two levels in the back, right? If you have a graft that dislodges, from multi-level corpectomy, like a three-level corpectomy, you got to fuse them from C2 all the way down to make sure that the, that the graft doesn't pop out yet again. And you may have to go one level down because when it pops out, it may have ripped out a lot of the bone. So the, the salvage for a graft dislodgement from a corpectomy is fairly significant. Whereas the salvage for a one or two level out of four that doesn't heal in the back is a fairly simple operation in the back. So think just uh, some food for thought when people are trying to peddle big surgery. Big surgery leads to bigger, um, larger amounts of reimbursement for the surgeon, but does not necessarily always lead to the best overall outcome. You can get, you can get fooled by the outcomes that you're measuring saying that the, the measurement outcome is quite good, but it but you don't get to hear about the other complications that lead to problems later on that are not disclosed, okay? So be very, very suspicious. What does tend to work, however, not a, is a hybrid, right? Which is a mixture of a corpectomy, a short corpectomy with a discectomy so that you can get multiple points of fixation and fewer levels of uh, fewer fusion surfaces to heal. And this is actually a very reasonable operation to do, a uh, reasonable approach to do if you want to decrease the number of fusion levels uh, and not have to go posteriorly. But again, you can do multi-level anter anterior operations. And then the area that doesn't typically heal on a multi-level ACDF is C67, which is the stress area. And eventually you just put a cable back here and the healing potential is 98% when you do a posterior one-level fusion. The 
the recommendation when you were doing a long time ago, the recommendation that people, that the societies gave or most of the groups gave, if you did a multi-level ACDF, more than three, three levels or more, it was recommended that you fuse them posteriorly because of the serothrosis rate. That means that you have to fuse them three levels in the back uh, or four levels in the back. And that's pretty significant for the patient. And really, if you think about it, if you, if you tell, talk to the patient about what to expect, a 30% non-union rate is 70% union rate. 70% of patients are gonna do just fine. And I'd rather take that risk and tell the patient that, and you put it that way, patients will probably take the risk that they'll just go ahead with the index operation and see if they don't heal, if they don't heal to have a smaller operation that, that doesn't hurt their muscles back in the, in the back of their neck as much. Okay. So serothrosis, stiffness, uh, adjacent segment uh, wear and tear. And that all happens. Every level that you fuse, you lose about 10% of your overall motion. And patients who have pain initially and they're stiff because of pain will tend to have better perceived motion after you re relieve their pain. Um, however, from a mechanical standpoint, they'll be limited to that point. Uh, it's 10% of normal motion that they lose, not 10% of the motion that they present with. So because of these issues with the motion and with adjacent segment disease, they, somebody that's very, very smart and, uh, um, and very inventive created disc arthroplasty. And disc arthroplasty is not new. It was, create, it was started by multiple people a long, long time ago with different types of devices, but materials were not very good at that time. People used uh, uh, Art Steffi, who was one of the uh, people who developed pedicle screws and got sued up the Wazuli for their pedicle, for during the pedicle screw litigation that our former uh, Dean, Dr. Kessler was, was uh, uh, involved in. He uh, created one of the very first lumbar discs made out of rubber. And it was a rubber disc made out of the same vulcanized rubber that they used in the Indy cars for their tires. As you can imagine, foreign material in the body, failure, Art Steffi turned into a bad guy. But he was actually, you know, trying to be inventive. He wasn't doing, he thought he was doing the right thing for his patients by trying new things. But I don't think that the patients liked him very much if he didn't disclose everything to them about that. Now, disc arthroplasty of the modern type started probably back in the early, late 90s, early 2000s. And it was started in Europe. And this is the very first design of the ProDisc C. And at that time, it was cobalt chrome with a titanium nitride uh, coating, which actually is a lower coefficient of friction than cobalt chrome. And the uh, ultra high molecular polyethylene uh, bearing surface, right? And because of the FDA, the titanium nitride was taken away and it was basically cobalt chrome on a titanium plasma spray. Again, polyethylene, ultra high molecular weight, uh, uh, gamma radiated polyethylene. And one of the, this was a steel implant. And you, you can imagine from your uh, experience with metal on metal hip implants, you would think that this particular implant would suck and cause ions and all sorts of problems. And apparently it's had actually had a very good overall track record over the last 10 years. And uh, metal ion uh, wear is fairly, uh, metal ion uh, levels are fairly low. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting. So the neck does not move as much or ha does not have the same amount of pressures as the, as the hips or the knees. And when we use, uh, that allows us to use different types of materials for that. And cervical disc to, uh, because we're running short on time, cervical discs are um, approved for one and two level. Uh, and uh, usually for people who have good bone stock and uh, not any prior cervical surgery or deformity. And they do very well over time. And they do seem to decrease the risk uh, 
for adjacent segment wear and tear and the reoperations over the course of 10 plus years is actually fairly low compared to fusions. So in actuality, in the right patient for a cervical disc replacement, uh, they, it actually uh, functions or, be, or performs superior to a fusion. Okay. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go through that uh, because it's not relevant. Uh, and it's important to see okay. this is a patient who's got a four level total left. disc replacement. Okay. This was back in the early 2000s. Turn. He's an airplane pilot. Good. This is Flex. his post op. Yeah, and then the other way. Oh, that's right? awesome. Okay, so this is just recently. So he stiffened up, you can tell. But this is now almost 15, 16 years out. And they're all, they're all functioning fairly well. And certainly better than a multi-level fusion. Okay, for aminotomies, uh, posterior approach for aminotomies for unilateral radiculopathy, right, is, um, is Ash still here? Has he come on yet? Ash. Yep, yep. Uh, I've got two more. Um, yeah, take your time. More minutes. So I will, um, I'm going to skip this part. Okay. And this is a posterior for aminotomy. And here's the facet. Here's the lamina. Lamino for aminotomy. You're taking down the lamina, right? It takes me more than five minutes, five minutes for this. So, and then now we're using a kerosene to remove, here's the, here's the nerve root right here, right? And this is the superarticular process at the level below, right? Remember that superarticular process is a key structure, both in the lumbar spine and cervical spine. It determines where the traversing and exiting roots are, right? Where you identify them. So here's the nerve root, here's the ligamentum flavum, and that's the thing. So finally, one last thing about complications before I give it off to Ash is the one complication in the anterior cervical spine that you have to be careful about is infection. Infections in the anterior cervical spine are extremely rare, right? They're less than 1%. If you find somebody who's got an infection in the anterior cervical spine, you have to make sure they do not have a esophageal perforation, okay? So esophageal perforation occurs very rarely in the spine, in the anterior cervical spine, but if it does occur, the infection can track in the retropharyngeal space all the way down to the mediastinum and patients get mediastinitis and then they can die. So how do you diagnose that? You do either a, a uh, uh, esophagram, right? You do an esophagram initially with hypake or a water soluble uh, dye contrast agent. And if you don't see anything obvious, then you can do a barium, follow that up with a barium swallow. The reason why you do water soluble first before barium is that barium can cause mediastinitis <laughs> as well. So if you've got a big old hole in your esophagus and you throw a bunch of barium down there, the patient doesn't do too well. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a small leak, the barium is actually much more sensitive at finding a small leak. Okay, That's because you have a negative high peak swallow does not necessarily mean that you do not have a hole there, a small leak. So you have to do both, if, right? So, uh, and other ways to find it is uh, contrast HT with oral, oral uh, contrast or uh, esophagoscopy, look inside the esophagus. Not so easy to find even when you look directly. 
Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, uh, any last question before, uh, in the last three minutes before I give it to back, give it to Ash. Thanks, uh, thanks Dr. Tay for that review. I had a question on cervical disc replacement. The two studies that I remember uh, reading about that were long-term studies for cervical discs were with the ProDisc 2, like a randomized control trial and the and the Charité, I don't know how to pronounce it, but oh. those two. Um, the Charité it, having... was a, uh, is a lumbar disc. Oh, it was a lumbar disc, okay. Yeah, and it's off the market because they had complications associated with it over time. It was actually created by a physical therapist in yeah. Europe. That's a design. And there was a lot of flack about that from who created, but it was certainly, you know, was popular for a while. Um, the Prodis C has a one level, we're probably out to about, uh, we're probably out to 15, 15 to 17 years. And we've just been asked to uh, find our patients again for the long-term follow-up study for that particular, that, that cohort. But it's been uh, it's been doing fairly well. So Abby, what what was your question? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I I had gotten mixed. I was thinking about lumbar disc replacements for those two. I was going to ask like, uh, what are your what's your current choice of cervical disc replacement? Um, like in terms of, yeah. Uh, current. So so think about it. You can use anything. Patients will do fine, right? Everything because you're treating the right problem. So no matter what you're comfortable with, go ahead and use it. It's totally fine. My, my, the reason why I use certain things is because uh, of application and, and insurance authorization. So Moby C is what I use for disc replacements right now, number one, because it's fairly easy to put in. No keel cutting and all that stuff that you have to do with Pro Disc, which is actually much more stable than the Moby C. However, uh, the Pro Disc is not approved for more than one level. The Moby C and the Prestige. LP, which is a Medtronic disc, are the only two currently that are approved for more than one level by the FDA. They have FDA clinical trials associated with them that uh, tell us their outcomes and their performance. I don't use the LP mainly because um, the way it's designed, it's a little bit finicky uh, for, because they have tabs in the front and you can't put it in as deep as you want because the tabs will block the insertion and the front of the uh, vertebra is not um, symmetric. As you pound it in, one tab, will, one tab will hit the bone. As you start to hit it, it'll start to rotate the implant. And I tried it, didn't like it. And therefore, uh, I use the thing that seems to be easiest and the easiest to get approval for. Uh, 